name is Brian Keller. Uh, I'm an alum of Holy Family, and I also handle government affairs here. I'd like to introduce our president, Dr. Ann Frisco. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to have you all with us here this morning at Holy Family University in our new town, one of our new town campuses. I thank you for joining us today to discuss such a critical topic. And I thank Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick for inviting us to host this panel discussion and for bringing this conversation to the forefront. As an anchor institution in Bucks County, with two locations in your town, Holy Family is committed to the communities we serve. And in fact, just about 90% of all of our students come from within 50 miles of here. So we very much are of this community. So an example of how we serve that community is our very own Professor Pat Griffin, who's here with us today on the panel, is a director of our graduate criminal justice program. She was awarded a considerable research grant to assess the practices and outcomes of the Bucks County Police Department. And this is what she had to say about this type of work. The opportunity for students to become involved in assessment and evaluation is an exemplar of what an applied program should look like. It will instill in our students critical skills they'll utilize throughout their careers, and many of them will work here in Bucks County. The security of our region, and in particular cybersecurity, which Congressman and I have been talking about for a few years now, is a top priority at Holy Family. Since launching our undergraduate program in cybersecurity last year, we already have 32 students majoring in that particular program, as well as we have additional students in applied computer science. With plans in our Newtown West Campus, we want to host a hacker's lab and start a Center for Excellence in Cybersecurity. So we will continue to play an important role in this conversation and advancing our region to secure ourselves. We know that the threats to society continue to grow, and we want to ensure that we are educating our students for in-demand jobs and that we continue to meet the demands of the community and the workforce. Congressman Fitzpatrick and panelists, I look forward to a productive and informative conversation. Now it is my pleasure to invite Congressman Barney Fitzpatrick to give opening remarks. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Fisco. And thank you, um, thank you all for being here. This is um, uh, a series of conversations we have uh, uh, on the Intelligence Committee. So there's a number of committees on co in Congress. Um, there's only one that you're required to be inside SCIP, the Secure Compartmental Facility, um, given the, the classified nature of, of the work we're doing. Uh, one of the things that Chairman Turner wanted to do was start bringing certain, you know, unclassified conversations that still deal with that content outside of the skip, out to the country. Um, so he has all the, the members of the committee doing just that, and that's what brings us here today um, to talk about something that uh, I will tell you is not getting, uh, it's getting little to no press coverage, but there is no more important thing in our country and in our world right now then the issue that is, uh, uh, if we do nothing, will expire at the end of this month. Uh, and that is Section 702 uh, of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, we have panelists here that I'm going to be asking questions to get their perspective. Obviously, we're, we're, uh, this is going to be a live telecast, so this is going to go back to uh, our committee, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as everybody who wants to tune in to the intelligence community on the, um, the streaming service um, to talk about this. Um, what is FISA? FISA is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It created the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, which essentially acts as a separate court system for the classified world. So what our committee is responsible for doing, the House Intelligence Committee, is we oversee the 19 intelligence agencies um, uh, that are part of the intelligence community, including my uh, former employer, the FBI. Um, there are a number of agencies, uh, some uh, devoted wholly to intelligence, some partially, the FBI being the perfect example. The FBI has a criminal division. They also have a national security division which handles counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and things that fall under the purview of the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the FISC, the court that was created or promulgated for show to it, essentially deal with the classified nature of the uh, national security program. Section 702 is very different. And this has been a challenge for us to explain 
uh, to our colleagues who don't have an intelligence background and to the country um, because the foreign intelligence program has not come without controversy, particularly in, in recent years. Um, the way the system is set up, much of it operates in secret. That's its nature. It's because it's, it operates in a classified environment. But with that comes certain risks. Uh, there are certain protections in place uh, in your traditional criminal court with transparency, with things that are sealed being unsealed within a certain period of time, um, uh, the right to cross-examination, um, just more safeguards in place. Those safeguards are not in place, and in some cases cannot be in place uh, on, the, on the national security side because of the nature of the secrecy of the information uh, that's being involved. So the challenge that a lot of my colleagues have and by the way, Section 702, this is important to note, uh, the FIS does not, uh, I'm sorry, Title I, traditional FISA, does not expire. Uh, Section 702 does. Section 702 was one of the many recommendations that flowed from the 9-11 Commission. Um, and I want to explain to you what that is. Section 702 is a very limited program uh, that applies only in two cases. You have to be a foreign national and outside of the United States. So if you're a, a U.S. citizen of Paris, cannot be used. If you're an Iraqi citizen in New York City, cannot be used. You have to both be a foreign citizen on foreign soil utilizing our home networks here. Um, in the national security context, America has a huge advantage uh, the national security uh, uh, realm because of essentially a home field advantage. With all the servers that are being used, mostly um, uh, our servers are used, um, I should say most of the time our foreign adversaries are using our servers versus uh, servers from another country. So Google, Gmail, Facebook, any platform that's American-based um, that's used by our adversaries, uh, we can collect on that for people that have no Fourth Amendment rights. When does it become a problem? It becomes a problem when there's incidental collection on Americans during these conversations. So if bad person one talks to bad person two when they forward an email that may have one of your names in the article, Maybe an article is forwarded, Newsweek or whatever, that name will get uploaded into the system and therefore that's what's called an incidental collection. So that's where the reforms have, um, have been focused on. But we also are reforming the FISC to provide more transparency while we're reauthorizing Section 702. Um, there is nothing more important uh, in Congress, nothing that I voted on that's going to be more important than this. We reauthorized it barely um, in 2018. It sunsets every five years. We barely got the votes then. There's been a lot of controversy that's ensued in the last five years, which is going to make it even a tougher lift to reauthorize it <clears throat> this year. But the consequences of not reauthorizing it is essentially we will be refer referring to a pre 9 11 security posture where the walls are a separation or build up between the law enforcement and the intelligence community. We simply cannot allow that to happen. Uh, so that's why. It's been a challenge to, uh, to, to get these reforms uh, to a place where we think we have um, uh, bipartisan and bicameral agreement. An additional complication is there's two committees of jurisdiction here. There's an intelligence committee, which I sit on, and there's a judiciary committee. Um, and for those of you who follow uh, Congress, uh, those committees are very different <coughs> in their makeup of the members that are on those committees. We think very differently. Um, but we've been meeting uh, regularly. We've had a representative group. Uh, from both committees uh, that have met consistently over the last eight months to try to get these reforms in a place where they need to be. Uh, myself and Darren LaHood have been the two um, uh, intelligence committee representatives for that task force. Um, so with that, I wanna, um, I'm going to allow the panelists to, uh, to introduce themselves, and then we're going to start. Uh, I'm going to be asking questions specific to your background that you can help um, share with our audience that's viewing online as well as the audience here. So we'll start uh, on the far right here. Good morning. My name is George Croner. Uh, I graduated from the Naval Academy and Penn Law School. Uh, I spent four years as the principal litigation counsel at the National Security Agency and then went into private practice for a long period of time. When I retired in 2016, I was fortunate enough to encounter the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, Raleigh Flynn is here today. She's the president of FPRI. Uh, and they entertained my desire to write about uh, foreign intelligence matters and most particularly Section 702. I began writing in 2017. In 
I've had over 50 articles published since that time on various platforms uh, and continue to do so today. And um, so I'm at a one trick pony and 702 is my trick. So uh, that's why I'm here today. Good morning, Congressman. My name is uh, Pat Griffin. I'm an associate professor of criminal justice here at Holy Family University, and I'm grateful to welcome everyone here today. To President Dr. Prisco, thank you so much for inviting me to participate, and to Congressman Fitzpatrick for bringing this conversation and the panel not only to Holy Family University, but to the broader community. So my background. Um, so I started out my professional career in criminal intelligence as part of the organized crime strike forces in the United States. And then I progressed to special agent, looking at transnational organized crime. And then at some point I moved into uh, an academic um, position where I helped to create intelligence curricula for undergraduate and graduate students. And as part of that, I was very much involved in electronic intelligence analysis. And I suppose much of my um, initial bias, I would suppose, uh, had to do with the way in which the Title I and the early adaptation of the FISA um, regulations were implemented. So when uh, 702 was put forth, um, I've been trying to follow it. I um, don't have direct experience with 702, nor the extensive um, writing and research in 702. But what I do have is an understanding of the culture of Generation Z. And I think, Congressman, what you were just addressing is the importance of culture in understanding how we're going to move forward with getting the reauthorization of 702. So I look forward to learning from my uh, panelists here and uh, contributing to the conversation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Claire Finkelstein, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with a primary appointment in the law school and a secondary appointment in the philosophy department. I'm also the founder and faculty director of something called the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. Uh, the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law is a center devoted to the study of national security and transnational conflict from the standpoint of the rule of law and, uh, and ethics. And we have been very focused on uh, matters relating uh, to intelligence, uh, in particular 702 for quite a while now. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that uh, George Croner has been uh, a member of our advisory council for a while and has helped guide our efforts in this regard. Uh, and uh, we have been uh, extremely focused on trying to explain uh, to the public and to national security professionals and to the students that I teach uh, why 702 is so important. So I'm very excited to have this discussion. Uh, a little bit more personal background, I should say that I started off my career in academia in the area of criminal law. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the Fourth Amendment discussions and many of the objections to 702 uh, that are raised from the Fourth Amendment standpoint. Um, and uh, I am very comfortable as a student of the Fourth Amendment and of constitutional law uh, that 702 needs reauthorizing. Uh, and so I'm uh, very pleased to be part of this panel. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman and uh, President Christie, for having me on the panel today. Good morning. My name is Jim Flavor. I'm a retired FBI special agent and supervisor special agent. Uh, when I retired, I was the supervisor of the FBI's uh, technical operations program here in Philadelphia. It's the application of the FBI's technologies to evidence and intelligence collection, uh, so supporting all of the investigative and intelligence programs in the FBI division. Uh, so my perspective on this is shaped by you know, that career as a, an FBI agent, supervisor, technical control, technical security agent, and supervisor of tax collection, um, and having like many FBI agents and first responders <coughs> spending time at ground zero after 9-11 and seeing the uh, immediate impact of our nation's intelligence failures in that. So, um, 
happy to share my perspective. Thanks, Thanks you, Jay. We'll start with Mr. Croner. Um, we could give, uh, give the audience uh, sort of a chronology of where this all began, where this journey began with 50702. What is it? How is it different from other authorities that are available as a tool of the national security community? Sure. FISA was originally passed in 1978. It was largely the product of the Congressional Committees investigating U.S. intelligence activities in the 1970s, known at the time as the Church and Pike Committees. And FISA was originally intended to correct what those committees had disclosed with respect to two national security agency programs conducted at the time, Shamrock and Minaret, that involved the targeted collection U.S. person communications in the United States without a warrant. So Congress passed FISA to make it unlawful to conduct electronic surveillance in the United States for foreign intelligence purposes without a court order. And that court order would issue from, as Congressman Fitzpatrick alluded, the newly created Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Now FISA defines electronic surveillance in specific terms, and by FISA at this point I'm talking about traditional FISA, as the Congressman alluded. And those terms were defined in 1978 based upon the state of the telecommunications industry at the time. At that point in time, everyone picked up their phone with their two twisted copper wires, and all domestic communications flowed by wire, whereas almost all international communications were passed by radio wave. And that was the paradigm that was used to define electronic surveillance as it existed in 1978 when FISA was first created. But if you fast forward 20 years, almost to the turn of the century, right before 9-11, that communication paradigm had completely flipped. With the advent of cellular technology, Americans and people around the world were now all <coughs> using cell phones. Well, radio communications to transmit what used to be a domestic communication by wire. At the same time, the, the large uh, concentration of international fiber optic cables that began being laid in the late 1980s had made international communications almost all flow by wire because fiber optic technology allows you to transmit communications at the speed of light. It became faster and more efficient. And so now you had literally flipped what that was going on in 1978. Most domestic communications were now being transmitted by radio wave or cellular technology and almost all international communications were flowing by wire. Uh, the change in technology was accompanied by a corresponding explosion in electronic communication. The advent of the cell phone, email messages, texting, all of that had now replaced, in many instances, certainly writing letters, sending telegrams, the sort of things that were still largely focusing uh, for the focus of international communications in the 1970s. Now, the US is the telecommunications hub of the world. As Congressman Fitzpatrick alluded, it is what makes 702 singularly advantageous to the United States. If you were to look at the International Fiber Optic Cable Network, it's like a whole bunch of snakes all heading towards the U.S. mainland. And they all come through the U.S. mainland. And so a substantial part of worldwide communications either transit the United States or reside, as Congressman Fitzpatrick said, on U.S. servers. Now, when 9-11 occurred, uh, the users of those foreign of, of that communications network, telecommunications network, included terrorists, including those terrorists who participated in 9-11. And as the government sought to protect against further attacks, President Bush at the time uh, began a highly classified program known as Stellar Wind, in which he ordered the National Security Agency to begin collecting communications that originated outside the United States from foreigners, but were directed to a party in the United States in an effort to gain intelligence on possible future attacks. The collection was invaluable, as it turned out. It was also unlawful under FISA, because one of the definitions of FISA is that if you have a wire communication, and fiber optic communications are wire communications that's coming into the United States, the non-consensual collection of a wire communication without a court order is unlawful under traditional FISA. Well, the secret seller wind program was disclosed by the New York Times in December 2005. And for the next three years, the Bush administration and Congress sought to put 
this type of collection on a lawful footing because it was recognized to be utterly invaluable. In fact, the inability to conduct that collection created what was called an intelligence gap at the time because you had all of these farmers, including all of these malign non-state actors. The whole sort of threat environment had also changed by the United States by the early 2000s from a bipolar environment back in the 70s when FISA was first passed, where you had the US and the Soviet Union, everybody sort of knew which side they fell on, and that's the way the world was aligned. By the mid-2000s, of course, that had been completely fractured. You had all sorts of non-state actors using U.S. telecommunications services with their communications flowing through the United States, and FISA prevented the government from getting them without a court order, and having, having been someone who worked on traditional FISA orders back in my day, the process is cumbersome. There were, just by way of order of magnitude, there were 347 Title I court orders handled by the FISA court last year, 347. There are 246,702 targets today. If you had to get a court order for every one of those targets, even assuming you could get the factual basis to get one, it's impossible. The FISA court cannot handle it. Section 702 is the congressional response to this problem. It essentially codified what the Stellar Wind program was and allows, as Congressman Fitzpatrick said, the United States to now take the advantage, the telecommunications advantage that is offered by the current worldwide structure and allow the U.S. government to target not U.S. persons, absolutely forbidden to target non-U.S. persons, uh, but target foreigners reasonably believed to be located outside of the United States to acquire foreign intelligence information, not by going and getting it from them, not by going to foreign countries to get it, but by going to U.S. telecommunications providers and with an order that says, here, give us the communications for this phone number, this email address. Now, that targeting decision has to follow a whole set of procedures that Congress has established. I won't get into the weeds with you on all of those right now, but all of these procedures are designed to protect U.S. persons, civil liberties, and privacy interests, but they allow the, the intelligence community to agilely and flexibly collect valuable foreign intelligence information from U.S. communication providers that are being used by all of these foreign entities. How valuable is that? 60%, when you consider all of the other intelligence sources the government has, 60% of what appears in the President's daily intelligence brief every day comes from Section 702 collection. It is the single most important foreign intelligence collection program that the U.S. government has. And if I can quote the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, echoing Congressman Fitzpatrick's thoughts, uh, if Congress were to allow 702 to lapse, the President's Intelligence Advisory Board said it would represent one of the worst intelligence failures of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump. Um, we need to bring it down to D.C. and brief some of my colleagues, by the way. <laughs> I do want to uh, just emphasize, and then I have a question for, uh, for Dr. Griffin. Um, a lot of the controversy and, and the discrepancy between the Intelligence Committee representatives, myself included, and our Judiciary Committee representatives is this, this desire for a warrant. And what we've tried to explain to them is that a warrant requirement imposed here, number one, would be extra constitutional. There's no other parallel legal analogy in any other part of the law for what they would be seeking here because the equivalent would be if a police officer pulls over a vehicle requiring that police officer to get a warrant before they run the license plate. Because all we're talking about here is querying a database of lawfully collected data. That's really what we're talking about here. Uh, but Dr. Griffin, um, I want to hear from your perspective as a practitioner, someone who's utilized the tool. Um, how is it used both domestically and internationally that you've seen? Thank you. And thank you so much for that introduction and overview of FISA. I think it's important for us all to kind of have an understanding of the background history and where we are today. Uh, so Congressman, um, I'd like to kind of pull it back to really focusing on that, the different subcommittees that you said are involved here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Intelligence Subcommittee and then we have the Judiciary. And I think that's part of the tension that I see as far as um, the students in my experience today and also working internationally 
in some low-income countries. So what I mean by that is, as a tool for collecting foreign intelligence information, it's invaluable. Boots on the ground from a law enforcement perspective, and perhaps that's where we might see that, you know, um, concerns raised through the judiciary, it's implemented by law enforcement officers here in the United States, right? So um, I think that's part of the issue that this type of panel can help to bring to the public's attention, right? And in my work with students both in the United States as well as working in low-income countries such as Kenya, Brazil, Bolivia, it really is about focusing on the culture of transparency. It's, it's not just the objectivity of what we're doing, but the percep perceptions of what we are trying to accomplish here. So um, understanding, I think, the value-laden components of 702 is really important. So uh, kind of building upon what my um, you know, colleague said here, that you know, as we are thinking about connecting the dots that may have been the gap for the 9-11 terrorist attacks, we are really focusing on building those partnerships and collaborations between the intelligence community and the law enforcement community. And having these listening sessions, being really able to get out there to the community is important. So when I'm working with undergraduate students in particular, you know, again, they are Generation Z. They are those 18 to 25 year olds who grew up in the digital age. They feel very comfortable working in a digital environment and they have a lot of questions. But along with that, they also have um, a reliance or say over-reliance on social media for their information and perhaps misinformation. So many of the things that we try to do, whether I'm working with the um, University of Kenya, or if I'm working in Bolivia, or here at Holy Family University, is really getting the students to think about, you know, uh, as critical consumers of information and where they're getting their information. So, for example, if we're thinking about 702 <clears throat> and how it's being utilized, it's very different than, let's say, um, something that they may pick up on a conspiracy theorist uh, blog or, or um, or way in which they are accessing information. So uh, we really have to focus, I believe, as we're looking towards the reauthorization of 702, is focusing on this Generation Z, and perhaps the millennials somewhat, because they're moving into a leadership position, but really focusing on talking about values and integrity as we go about collecting information that's gonna be turned into intelligence. Because if we wait until someone is actually in that position of leadership, we may have missed a, an opportunity to really help guide this younger generation. So um, I really think it's important what the subcommittee is doing and getting out into the street. And for anyone who's um, listening online or any of folks from the media, being able to convey the importance of being able to digest what's happening through these governmental websites, I think is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Finkelstein, let's look at the other side of the court. Um, last spring, there was a Fisk court opinion that was declassified um, that the media covered that talked about the pitfalls of FISA, some of the abuses that uh, could and, in fact, did occur with FISA. Why don't you touch upon that? Because there's two sides of the coin here, obviously, mm -hmm. in the national security world. You have national security and you have privacy, and we always have to try to balance the two and not, you know, go all in on one at the exclusion of the other. So if you could talk about that. Well, thank you so much, Congressman. Um, and let me just begin by emphasizing the importance of 702. Uh, my colleague George Croner has done an excellent job of, of doing that already. But I think I could underscore the point by saying that not only does roughly 60% of the president's daily brief come from 702, but I would go so far as to say that if 702 had been in place on September 10th, 2001, the attacks on 9-11 might not have occurred. This is very, very important, as uh, Mr. Croner emphasized, because 
one of the things that 702 allows us to do is to, to, to jump forward to a point where we can highlight national security threats, in particular overseas national security threats, in a way that we couldn't prior to 702. The vast majority of 702 collection has actually nothing to do with U.S. persons. And so the Fourth Amendment is, <clears throat> is not implicated. We are, we are involved in supporting two foreign governments in vitally important transnational conflicts. Some of the very important intelligence that the U.S. has helped to uh, support Ukraine with. For example, the discovery that Russia was kidnapping Ukrainian children and bringing them to Russia was collected on 702 data. So, um, so I just wanted to emphasize how foolish it would be under these uh, very dire circumstances where the U.S. Uh, has no respect for democracy on the one hand and a terrorist organization on the other hand uh, to do away with our main uh, national security intelligence tool. Now, with regard to constitutional objections and other objections, uh, the case, the, the controversy that you refer to, um, in a way, has nothing to do with 702. It has to do with Title I of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And if you'll recall, there was a report by Inspector General Horowitz some years ago which identified some problems with the way that uh, the FBI was using the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It was not, uh, to the best of my understanding in that report, an intentional abuse of FISA, uh, particularly Title I of FISA on the part of the FBI, but a certain sloppiness that was identified in the Horowitz report there was enormous controversy around uh, the FISA warrant that uh, was used to surveil Carter Page, for example. The fact that he had been a prior intelligence asset was not identified in the FISA request. Uh, it's important to remember, uh, first of all, that the Horowitz report did conclude that the FISA warrant <coughs> on Carter Page was well predicated in the end. But second of all, the FBI did take steps following that report to tighten up its act. And I'm not an expert on uh, Title I procedures. I'm sure George could speak to us more uh, intelligently about that. We're here for 702 today, so we're not here for Title I. But what happened was, I think in the wake of concerns about the way that the FBI was using Title I, there was a sense that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater, we should get rid of all of FISA, or we should get rid of 702 because the government was overstepping its bounds. Uh, and I think that is um, a most unfortunate result for 702 because the suspicion that it cast on this very important program uh, was really not, not warranted based on the Title I concerns. Um, they are valid concerns, but they can be addressed within the, the context of FISA. Now, the other set of concerns, so the Title I concerns is one set of, of issues. The other set of concerns are the very valid concerns about surveillance of Americans and reasonable search and seizure requirements under the Fourth Amendment. So what does that mean? If the government wants to search your home or listen in on your phone calls or um, look, read your emails, it has to get a warrant. Um, and that is part of our Fourth Amendment constitutional guarantees as Americans. And it is something that needs to be protected, and rightly so. Civil liberties groups are adamant uh, that the Fourth Amendment guarantees that we have not be weakened, and they see the threats uh, from national security surveillance as a kind of chipping away at the um, Fourth Amendment protections that we have. Why do they believe that? Well, because in the case in which 
a foreign suspect is targeted abroad and an American is involved in the communications, those communications can be under 702 incidentally collected and later the database that contains those U.S. Uh, communications can be queried under 702 under certain circumstances and the government then has access to the <clears throat> communications of Americans. So what the civil libertarian groups are saying, civil liberties groups are saying is that we should eliminate 702 in order to eliminate the incidental data collection on Americans. It's very important to remember that that's a very small percentage of all of the 702 queries, all of the 702 um, uh, uh, collections that are going on. That's the first thing to notice. The second thing to pay attention to is the fact that, of course, one could reauthorize 702 and require a warrant just for querying the database of Americans' communications. Now, that is a measure that I do not favor. Um, I'm very glad that the, uh, the report uh, that, the, um, that the working group has put out here uh, from the Select Committee on Intelligence also does not favor that because it would very much um, hamper uh, collection efforts in, in cases in which the querying of that database is very important and needs to occur. Um, there is a growing problem of um, domestic violent extremism in this country, of radicalization in this country, and the lines between uh, foreign terrorism and threats that are on U.S. soil continues to grow and it is important that when U.S. citizens are in touch uh, with persons abroad who are involved in terrorism, that the government has access to those communications. Um, that is a conversation that we can continue to have. Um, but I think that, as I've said, throwing the baby out with the bathwater makes no sense with regard to the entire 702 program. Yeah, thank you. Um, JJ, so we, we talked about um, collection. So this is a program that gets certified annually in three silos. Uh, there's targeting, there's querying, and then there's minimization. That's the collection process. And there's three agencies at play here, particularly with 702. It's the NSA, it's the CIA, and it's the FBI. Uh, JJ, you spent your career with the FBI. Um, why don't you talk about the usage side of this? Certainly. Um, and as the Congressman alluded, um, you know, there are, there are plenty of other intelligence agencies in the U.S. There are plenty of other law enforcement agencies in the U.S. at the federal level. But there's only one agency that is both a domestic intelligence agency and a domestic law enforcement agency, and that is the FBI. And that's why I think sometimes this focus on potential abuses or issues in the past uh, gets focused on the FBI because of its unique role um, in both intelligence and uh, law enforcement. And there are certainly times when actionable intelligence that is developed through uh, collection means, including 702, when that intelligence is going to result in FBI investigations, be they intelligence investigations or criminal investigations. And the FBI has, in my opinion, done an excellent job over the years in fixing some of the systemic problems that existed in which that overlap between intelligence and uh, the criminal investigation side could have potentially impacted the, say, the Fourth Amendment rights of U.S. citizens. Um, I've never seen an instance in the FBI where someone intentionally wanted to violate those rights. No FBI agent wants to do that. It jeopardizes the investigation. It jeopardizes the, their career. It's not something that someone wants to do, but there certainly were potentially still are certain systemic problems that exist. But to, as, as Claire said, to, to abolish this program removes a very important tool that is protecting U.S. citizens every day, protecting the United States. Uh, when these leads are developed, 
if a criminal case is going to proceed, then it is handled according to the law and according to the protections that we're all afforded. So criminal information is never obtained without a warrant in these, in these instances. When the application of these, this intelligence, this actionable intelligence generates from, say, a 702 query. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's the application on the street every day that's what's most important here. That FBI agents conducting the investigations that we're never going to read about in the paper. Most of these investigations, you're never going to hear about. Uh, but they are the investigations that are preventing acts of terrorism. Uh, because we certainly, as, as you said, we certainly don't want to go back to pre-9-11 posture on our ability to collect and use the intelligence that we're collecting. So it's, it's these investigations every day in every of all 56 field divisions of the FBI that are so important and are, are what are potentially in, at risk here and in jeopardy. If we don't have this intelligence to generate these investigations, be they intelligence or criminal, it really is almost irrelevant. So having the safeguards in place is what's most important to make sure that this program is allowed to continue and that it operates within the context of the law and the Constitution. Um, and the FBI and the other <coughs> intelligence agencies and other law enforcement agencies that use this intelligence that's collected, they are they retain the ability to, to do that. Dr. Kerner, um, three agencies at play here, right? And I say CIA, FBI, if you could walk us through the role that each of those play. What piece of the puzzle do they have? Sure. Uh, there's a, actually, there's a, a fourth agent. Only four agencies have access to collected 702 information. In addition to the three the congressman identified, the National Counterterrorism Center mm -hmm. also gets access to the data database. NSA is the principal agency responsible for running the program. It has the overall database of all acquired 702 communications, and under the minimization rules, most of those communications can stay in the database for up to five years. Uh, the CIA also has access to a smaller subset of the database based upon its own intelligence needs. The FBI, interestingly enough, for all of the controversy that surrounds uh, the fact that it supposedly is pillaging through the 702 database, trying to have U.S. persons and identify them for criminal law enforcement purposes, only gets access to 3.2% of the overall number of targets uh, in the 702 program. It gets access only to those targets that it nominates for collection, and it nominates targets only based upon whether there are fully predicated national security investigations related to those targets. So, for example, based on 2022 numbers, when I say there were 246,000-plus targets out there, which there were, the FBI is only getting communications for about 8,000 of those targets, the 3.2 percent that const constitutes its nominated targets. And it, those come into its database, and as I said, they're all predicated on fully predicated national security investigations, which means the U.S. persons that are in that part of the database are those U.S. persons who happen to be communicating with the targets of fully predicated national security investigations. So that's who has access to it. That's how it's sort of divided up. And then, as was alluded to earlier, the process, when all of this is collected, people think maybe a 702 is operating like a wiretap in, in a more conventional law enforcement sense. It isn't. In a conventional law enforcement wiretap, there is contemporaneous minimization, as the congressman alluded to, minimization procedures. An agent is sitting there listening to the phone calls, or if there are email messages, they're being reviewed instantaneously for minimization purposes. Because we're talking about, obviously, in a wiretap, one, two, maybe three targets uh, that are being individually monitored. Uh, and that can be handled then as well within the ability of the FBI to do so. In the NSA or the 702 program, there are literally hundreds of millions of communications that are in the 702 <laughs> database. And they reside there anonymously forever. They're extracted by this querying process. <clears throat> Uh, and it's the querying process that, frankly, is, is at the heart of the civil liberties and privacy folks and their objection to 702. They want the United States government to have to get a warrant, uh, a 
court order from the FISC, I shouldn't call it a warrant, that's a law enforcement term, a court order from the FISC even to query the database using a U.S. person identifier, your name, your social security number, your date of birth, something like that. They want you to have to go to court to get one. There is no requirement under the Fourth Amendment that that happen. Even the opponents who want this admit it's not required by the Constitution. They want it as a policy judgment to protect privacy and civil liberties. Uh, but it's not required. Now, as I said earlier, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court adjudicated 337 Title I FISA orders last year. The FBI ran 120,000 U.S. person queries uh, last year, and the rest of the intelligence community ran about another 10,000. The idea that the U.S. government now to use a U.S. person query would have to go to the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and get a court order from one of the 11 judges that sits that rotates on, on two-week increments through D.C. every two weeks and then goes back to their home. Uh, these are the judges that sit on this court don't do this full time. They're U.S. federal court judges confirmed by the Senate. Uh, Article three judges that come in for two week rotations. And now you're going to tell these people that did 337 of these last year. Oh, you have 130,000 now that are going to be coming your way. Uh, so get ready, buckle up and get these done. It won't happen. It's a proxy, frankly, in my view, the, the argument for this court order is a proxy for shutting down U.S. person queries. I agree. <laughs> Dr. Griffin, um, do you want to talk about some of the existing safeguards that are in place? And um, we, we have copies of, of uh, the, the work that resulted from eight months of myself and my, my colleagues on the task force um, hearing from a whole range of experts. Um, which will, is available online, we'll be able to direct you to it. But can you talk about the existing, before these reforms even take place? Hopefully they will, hopefully we get this passed. Um, but the existing safeguards on the FBI side. So I am optimistic that this will be reauthorized. And I think that the work that your subcommittee has done and, and the work across the nation has been uh, monumental and I am optimistic. So I'll put that out there. Um, I also appreciate what you were saying about the volume of um, additional workload, I suppose you would say, for our uh, federal judges that would be part of the um, judicial review were that not to be the case, were we not to be able to reauthorize this. Uh, so with regards to the safeguards, I think what's most valuable, and again, following up on what JJ said, I think the compliance efforts within the FBI have been just instrumental over the past 18 months. I think that... Um, I would agree that these, uh, you know, the challenges or the uh, problems that we've seen uh, with regards to the application of 702 uh, were not intentional in many ways. And I think one of the areas that I was most, um, I, it seems so simple and commonplace, but that if you were to opt in to one of these person's queries, you have to actually opt in. It's just not an automatic 702 evaluation. So I think that's the most, I guess, um, low-hanging fruit, if you would say. But the FBI has taken like really active steps to address these challenges. And I think that um, you know, moving forward, I think it, it's very possible to be able to uh, implement these on the ground. And again, I'll go back to the importance of culture when it comes to the application of 702 and our national security. What values, what beliefs, what um, actions are we willing to be open-minded to if we were to say my national security is at stake? And so I think many people, and again, I'll focus on Generation Z that I work with on a regular basis, um, they are very, uh, I guess, uh, skeptical about the government and about politics. But if you ask them to talk about their values and their belief systems and you share some of these internal mechanisms that have been put into place with the FBI, I think that you'll find that this generation is very supportive of our politics, of our government, and they represent 10% of the voting population right now. So really being able to get out into the community, be able to speak to 
this generation about the importance of national security is an important step also in this process. Thank you. It's Dr. Finkelstein. Um, most of the, uh, the, to the extent that 702 is ever credited in, 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 in certain categories, people mainly think of counterterrorism, they think of counterintelligence, mainly Russian, Chinese, and Iranian uh, nuclear uh, enrichment, uh, uranium enrichment, I should say. Uh, fentanyl uh, from um, uh, cartels along the southern border. But there's another uh, huge uh, use of it, and that's in the diplomatic mission. So I was wondering if you could touch upon that as well. Well, there are concerns that have been raised about abuse of 702 um, for things like um, making sure that when we have a, a diplomat that is going overseas, that the, the individuals that he or she is meeting with are safe for that person to encounter. And this is often cited as uh, one of the areas where 702 is, is too widely used. Um, another area uh, where it is, is cited as too widely used is um, for political purposes. So. In, uh, in 2020, the FBI, the FBI ran a batch query of unminimized FISA information um, using identifiers of 133 individuals arrested in connection with civil unrest and protests uh, relating to the Black Lives uh, Matter uh, movement. Um, these are areas where I think reauthorization proposals can look more carefully to try to hone how 702 is used. In the first area, there is some legitimacy, right? So when you have um, high-level diplomats going overseas that may uh, run a risk of encountering uh, terrorists, dangerous persons, and be at risk, um, of course, to the extent that 702 is being used to uh, to target non-U.S. persons, uh, there is little concern. When those same individuals are encountering, uh, when, when 702 is being used um, to protect those same individuals on U.S. soil, that's when we may start to worry that we're getting a kind of uh, fudging of the line between um, national security purposes and domestic law enforcement purposes. Um, I think that the, um, the working group has done a very good job of trying to identify ways that the law enforcement uh, potential abuses of 702 can be separated from the national security purposes. Uh, and uh, there are ways to control that <clears throat> to some extent, to make sure that these abuses are, are not happening. Um, but uh, it's not, as I've emphasized, a reason to deprive the country mm -hmm. of uh, the the tools altogether uh, of 70, that 702 provides for our national security. And JJ, do you want to touch upon, uh, Dr. Griffin touched upon it a little bit, but some of the safeguards that the Bureau uh, put in place, some some were legislatively required, some were self-imposed uh, by the Bureau. What were the manifestations of that that you either personally experienced or that you've since learned uh, since leaving the Bureau? Well, you know, when I started in the Bureau a long time ago, it was a criminal law enforcement agency that also did intelligence. Um, that was almost secondary. Uh, post 9-11, the intelligence side was um, really increased, uh, was incorporated more. And I think that's uh, maybe where some of these problems have arisen. It's, uh, you know, perhaps the blurring of that line between the intelligence side and the criminal side, particularly when it comes to the application of certain um, legal requirements. Um, so, you know, the FBI has done, uh, particularly probably since 2017, has, I think, done a very good job of looking at itself and realizing that there were some deficiencies in how compliance with FISA and particularly with 702 was, was measured and monitored and how it was reported. Um, but, I, you know, I think there's certainly... With the reauthorization of 702, there's probably an opportunity to um, 
maybe strengthen some of these. And, you know, the FBI, uh, you know, J. Edgar Hoover died in 1972. The FBI uh, is certainly more amenable than it has ever been, particularly in these discussions, to outside, appropriate outside examination and reporting of its activities. Um, so, you know, having this, say, probable cause standard, or even a reasonable suspicion standard in the, in using some of the 702 data for predicated national security investigations. There are certainly already existing review processes through the Department of Justice, through the U.S. Attorney's offices, through the uh, Office of Inspector General for, you know, reviewing how these are used. Um, training is always an issue. Um, you know, making sure that agents and intelligence analysts that are accessing this data and using this data are trained appropriately uh, so that they know the appropriate uses and they know how to report any potential abuses. Uh, because, you know, if, if there are errors made, those errors need to be reported and corrected. And, and certainly from a cultural standpoint, I think the FBI is in a place to do that. Um, but it's certainly, if, if that's what it requires to convince people <clears throat> that this, this reauthorization is appropriate, then, then the FBI is, would certainly be amenable to that. Dr. Croner, um, looking forward to the reforms. Um, what do you see as the most pressing reforms that are needed to the system? Um, obviously, some are substantively needed, and then there's another political aspect to this, that people need certain things, the perception to change about FISA, which may not change the actual policy, but will change the optics of it. For example, limiting the opportunity of abuse, even though there may not be substantive abuse in a given area, but if it limits the opportunity for it, they may want that change. But if you can just talk about the reforms, what do you think is necessary? Uh, we already talked about what you think would be harmful, right? Imposing a, a warrant requirement, which would uh, expand the FISC by a factor of about 1,000, right? Um, but what do you think the needed reforms are? What, what can we do to fix the system? I think this reauthorization cycle is all about the FBI. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, the, the, the archest of privacy and civil liberties advocates will point to the fact that, well, NSA shouldn't be allowed to conduct U.S. person queries without some sort of regulation. You ought to make it a probable cause requirement that they can only do it if you can establish that the U.S. person is an agent of a foreign power. I don't think that's necessary. I don't think that there's any documented history uh, that that's happened at NSA. Uh, so this comes down to the FBI's querying practices. And the draconian way of correcting uh, perceived, real or perceived abuses of FBI U.S. person queries is to make them get a court order because, as I said, effectively, that will stop them. Uh, there won't be any more U.S. queries because the FISC won't be able to handle the workload. Uh, the FBI gets somewhere north of 90% of its intelligence information related to uh, cyber activity, malicious cyberware, uh, and so on from U.S. person queries. So if you want to give up that kind of intelligence, you can do that. Instead, I think, as the, the uh, working group has pointed out, uh, that Congressman Fitzpatrick participates in, there is a middle ground. You can require the Bureau uh, to uh, maybe even statutorily include the changes that the Bureau has made since essentially June of 2021, when it recognized probably with respect to the approaching reauthorization uh, that it needed to do a little house cleaning and it changed its tech systems, as Pat said, to require you to, to actually physically opt in to 702 information instead of the old way where you had to opt out and nobody did it. And the next thing you knew, every U.S. person query was being run against uh, uh, US per, uh, the uh, 702 database even when it wasn't intended to. Uh, you can change the require attorney approval for batch queries on some level. You can reduce the size of batch queries to the extent that uh, above a certain minimum number, whether it be 10, 20, I think the current FBI standard is 100, maybe Congress wants to make it 25 or 30, but you get attorney approval for batch queries in the process. Um, as I said, you can federate the systems in such a way that you have to opt in. There are special U.S. person queries where, for example, uh, a U.S. legislator is involved, a religious figure, 
a political activist, a political candidate. Those kind of special uh, queries maybe require further approval up the chain. And indeed, the Bureau has instituted a reform requiring, I believe, deputy director approval for those types of US person queries. The problem is, I won't say it a problem, they're all policy measures that the FBI has implemented within, say, the last two years. I'm not sure that given the, uh, the atmosphere surrounding 702 this year, that Congress isn't going to have to legislate some of those policy measures into the statute. And the statute, the bills that are out there now from the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, what I'll call the Government Surveillance Reform Act, which is Senator Wyden's bill, uh, they all call for implementing some of these policy measures into the statute to make sure that there is a statutory basis uh, uh, for ensuring that FBI querying processes are improved going forward. I think the FBI, you could reduce within the Bureau the number of agents that actually have access to 702 information, call that down. And of course, there's always obviously the additional training uh, that's needed to ensure that people recognize that this particular special source of intelligence uh, uh, is uh, valuable and needs to be handled differently. You can change the criminal and civil penalties associated with FISA, which are in Title I of FISA, but actually also apply to 702 and make them more severe uh, to make it very clear that the violations of 702 querying requirements are going to result in these additional substantial penalties. I think those kinds of reforms can be, can and probably should be, and, well, first of all, you're not going to get a clean raw <coughs> authorization this year. There's, there's no way that's going to happen. Uh, so I think there's going to have to be some level of compromise. Obviously, personally, I hope that people like Congressman Fitzpatrick prevail in that debate uh, and keep this absolutely indispensable intelligence tool uh, in a workable, usable fashion that preserves its flexibility and agility. But you're going to have to have some of those items that I mentioned I think be probably part of any part of the statutory reform. And from my perspective, if the Bureau can live with it, I can live with anything short of a court order, which I think just suffocates the U.S. person queries for the reasons that I've discussed earlier. Yeah, I'll tell you there's one way there would be a clean reauthorization, and that's if, and, and this is actually could be a bad thing, um, if, if the Speaker decides to extend it for 30 days to give more time to um, navigate the, the differentials between the Intelligence and the Judiciary Committee, one of the ways we plan on trying to get this through is to attach it, the way this works in a lot of issues in Congress, is you attach it to a must-move must piece of legislation. We have the NDAA coming up, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, and the plan was to attach these reforms to that bill and pass them all together, potentially putting it on suspension, which is a, a congressional term for you don't have to go through the Rules Committee. It requires two-thirds and not a simple majority. But there is some talk about doing a 30-day extension, taking us into next year, clean reauthorization, and then giving us 30 days to work out these discrepancies. The problem with that approach, the problem with that approach, is there is no working out the discrepancy of a warrant requirement that's going to exponentially and insurmountably expand the workload of the FISC in a matter that's extra constitutional. There is no other, there, there is no other legal protections that are analogous to that in any other area of the laws, as the example of the, um, the car stop that I gave you, but I just want to go down the line. Um, I do want to open up to, uh, to audience questions as well, but uh, any reform ideas um, that any of you think we should be considering, uh, because this is obviously still a work in progress. I'd just like to, uh, again, thank you for bringing this to, um, you know, to Newtown campus, but also I think your summary is spot on. I also think that I would echo against having the additional uh, warrant requirement because I think in the judiciary, there's also concern around the political nature of it, of the judiciary. And whereas within the executive branch with the FBI, you know, there is um, transparency, if we say, around training, around compliance, about, so I would really focus on those internal measures that the FBI has taken, and I concur with my uh, colleague up here. And um, one of the things that you had suggested was limiting the number of people to do the searches and increasing the approval. So they have increased the approval for what you're referring to, which is a, a sensitive investigative matter, which is anything that Im impacts 
sensitive circumstances, whether it be a re religious organization, member of the media, a political candidate, anything that would uh, um, um, raise a level of approval. But having uh, chief division counsel uh, sign off in every single field office, there's 56 field offices, and maybe limit, that's in terms of the approval, and then maybe limit the number of people that can actually do the query, maybe limiting it to uh, supervisory intelligence right. analysts or senior supervisory intelligence analysts, so that they all funnel through, they all get approved by the lawyer that runs the office or the head lawyer in the office, and are limited in terms of the number of people that can actually uh, do the search as well. And, and those sensitive uh, circumstances already exist on the criminal they side. They do. You, you can't get a Title III uh, court order or a wire interception on a member of clergy, on an elected politician, on an attorney, without higher levels of approval. So that already exists in the FBI, so extending it and ensuring sure. is, is appropriate. Uh, Congressman, what I would suggest for reforms, and you have many of them in this report, but I would really emphasize the, the transparency enhancements. Um, part of why we are in this position relative to the public is because of the history with the metadata program, the 213 program. Uh, when the American public discovered that there was, a, that the NSA was quote unquote spying on Americans, and it was not previously aware of the metadata program, there was an explosion in this country. And there was a, a sense that that was an, an absolute outrage from the standpoint of privacy and civil liberties. And I think that in the wake of that, the NSA felt that, that they should have done more to be transparent with the public about the nature of that program. They tried belatedly to explain the importance of that program. As you know, eventually the program what was uh, not found to be unconstitutional, but it was found to be unauthorized by statute. And, and so we do not have the benefit of 213 anymore. But I think what's so important is to restore faith in the intelligence community and in our intelligence operations. And the best way to do that is to enhance the transparency of our operations. So regular reports to the public about US person queries, about the number of queries. Uh, I think also measures such as uh, uh, that prohibit U.S. person queries relating to political activities or political orientation would be very critical. You have a number of these suggestions, the amicus curiae uh, procedures uh, that allow uh, for weighing in on uh, U.S. person queries is also an important um, matter which is uh, currently available but can be enhanced. So I think measures that seek to restore confidence uh, via transparency would be the most important measures to enact in, in a reauthorized statute. JJ, do you have anything further? I don't. No. No. Um, th this is a classic example of um, you know, the, the privacy versus security continuum. Uh, yeah. Shortly after 9-11, when the Patriot Act uh, was put up for vote, it, it passed by a vote of 99 to 0 in the Senate. One senator, Russ Feingold, who represented Wisconsin, abstained because everybody's guard was up right after 9-11. And with every passing year, it's become harder and harder to uh, reauthorize some of those provisions. Some of them have fallen off altogether. Um, and it's, it's uh, a challenge that we always face. It's um, much like um, you know, the West gets criticized for you know, the concept of war fatigue, where um, some of our adversaries bank on us uh, dropping our guard. Uh, Vladimir Putin has banked that into a strategy in Ukraine that the West is going to wane. Uh, Osama bin Laden has made comments and his colleagues in the past that uh, uh, America lives by the clock and we don't know watches. That's one of his famous sayings. That's something that we have to fight against. We shouldn't need another terror attack uh, to, 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 to make these changes and, and keep the systems that we have in place. Um, and, and that's really our, our focus here. Um, the irony in this, in this uh, uh, debate we're having in Congress right now is that the challenges that exist with the FISC and the challenges that exist with FISA now, those provisions are not up for, are, are not expiring. 702, which is 
largely uncontroversial, not without, completely without controversy, but largely uncontro uncontroversial, we're using the reauthorization of this to make the reforms here for the, for the, for the program that's not expiring. So the interesting Next. irony is that many of the people that want a warrant requirement over here, which essentially will mean nothing will happen, mean that these vulnerabilities will still exist. So the very people that are complaining about the problems in Title I traditional FISA are potentially missing that opportunity to fix it by drawing the battle lines over here. And that's the political challenge that we have um, uh, in Congress right now. Uh, the clock is ticking, um, but we're going to do everything we can to get this done because there's an awful lot uh, at stake. So with that, um, I don't know if we have any, um, uh, Kelly, we're going to take questions from the audience. Sure, if anyone has any. Yes. Uh, Ed. on the question of whether Kevin Kleinsmith and how easily he slipped the noose for a clear violation of, of procedure, if not law. Could you talk about Kleinsmith and how one year probation for lying to the FISA court winds up creating a lack of public confidence yeah. that this tremendous power which we need to give to our counter-terror people, how that winds up being eroded when a guy like Kleinsmith gets to go relatively unscathed. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Anybody? I just, I just, okay. um, I just did a presentation yeah. on one of the, uh, the witnesses in the, in the Durham matter, so I can't speak. Uh, in too much detail about this, but um, you know, um, Mr. Klein Smith was um, did plead guilty to a, a thousand and one violation. Um, it is a um, uh, very common um, disposition in a case like that to have uh, one thousand and one be the the result. Um, I think it was felt that uh, it was not as intentional and malicious uh, as it was perhaps portrayed as in the media. Um, and it was uh, viewed as a fitting penalty for the, for the crime under the circumstances, a very uh, significant result for an FBI uh, analyst to end up with a with a uh, criminal conviction of that sort. That's all I can say about it. But I certainly agree with you about the importance, as I said before, of restoring faith in the, uh, in the intelligence operations of the country. And... Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think that's right. And when you, but when you think about the volume the volume of uh, FISA orders and you know the every once in a while the cases that uh, go awry, um, you have to probably still conclude that the FBI is doing a pretty good job as indeed the Horowitz report did. Um, but but also this this working group report does a very good job of, of summarizing what some of the reforms were. Um, since those days, and I and I think uh, we should give some credit, enormous amount of credit, in fact, to to uh, to the FBI post Horowitz report about uh, the changes that were made and, and take those rather seriously. But this is where the transparency piece is so important because the public needs to be convinced of that. Ed, was that um, was that a, a plea or was that a, a guilty? Verdict? It was a guilty plea. He took a plea. Do you remember what the the, the guideline rage was for him? Yeah, that would be very unlikely on a guilty plea for 1001. Yeah. I just think it's a shame because it's 
Yeah, any, anything that anything that erodes public, you know, pub, public confidence in the institutions is, is incredibly important for those institutions to be able exactly. to do their work. I mean, everybody that's worked <clears throat> in the law enforcement realm knows, uh, you know, in the FBI, we relied on the public to cooperate with us so that we could keep the community and our country safe. Uh, they're force multipliers. That's how we viewed them. And cooperation is necessary. That's the most important thing. And everybody in law enforcement knows that the most important skill you can have as an agent or an investigator is recruiting sources, managing sources, being able to, you know, flip them um, and expand your your net. Um, and if you don't, if people are shutting the door in your face because they don't trust you because of some, you know, either accurate or misreporting, that's a problem. It makes us all less safe. Yes, sir. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'll give you one example, Crossfire Hurricane. Uh, I'll just give you my opinion. That was not sloppiness. Um, you, you have an obligation as an agent and, a, and, a, and an approving prosecutor that anything exculpatory doesn't get buried in a footnote on page five. It, you lead with that. You start with that. You have to affirmatively bring it to the judge's attention that this exculpatory information exists. Uh, the source of information, if this is opposition research um, in a political context, that First of all, it shouldn't even be accepted. Part of our reforms would not even allow something like that. So I agree with you, sir. Um, you know, th th there, there are some cases of sloppiness. There's other cases of intentional misconduct. Uh, and th that is one of the, the, the gravest sins anyone in a position of public trust can, can violate. Because when you do that, it's not, it's not just limited to that individual case. That, that lack of trust bleeds over into all sorts of things. So when... Any institution deals with problems. Um, I'll use the FBI, for example. That affects every single agent, including the really good ones who are trying to do their job. And it's not fair to them. It's not just limited to that one case. So I could not agree with you more. And um, I'd encourage you to look at these reforms because it's, it's five different silos. It, it, it reforms the FISC. Uh, it has massive transparency. It has accountability for the first time. Uh, any agent or analyst that, um, that is found to have intentionally violated the rules, there, there's, there's consequences but, uh, embedded into the law, not just an, an FBI policy that says that they're going to be OPR'd or they're going to be put on the bricks for a week um, or reassigned to another division, but there's actually criminal consequences. Now, is there a risk that that might chill activity? On balance, that's, I think those are the forms that we need to have because ultimately the public needs to have faith in these institutions. They need to have faith in the system to cooperate, because without cooperation, you could have the best tools available at your disposal. If the public is not cooperating, the organization will shut down and our country is less safe. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Five billion dollars to go to study the Chinese. What did our intelligence community do to study these people and understand them? Understand that they come to this country and they are associated with people over there. <clears throat> and we are labeling them based on their association. I knew a general, his name Colin Powell, but I called him Austin Powell. So am I associated with the general, or am I associated with Uncle Powell? So the difference with the intelligence community, they are basing their information on CIs, which are, to begin with, I call them <laughs> uh, uh, really people with crime backgrounds who are really being caught into the system, and then the system is using them to infiltrate information to them and give them that kind of information. Dr. Fentelstein, I agree with you. Had FISC or Pfizer have been available or working, doing their job very well during September 11, on September 10 would never happen. Guess what? We had tremendous amount of intelligence people, Congress people, Senate, once they retire, they go to the media and they get these beautiful positions. And guess what? You all talk about we knew about September 11 was going to happen. It's not we need additional programs. I think we should abolish the Pfizer because we have already these programs called CIA, MEIA, whatever it is, you want to call them. Let's reaffirm these programs that we established in the old days and make them more supportive to our development realistic development. I cannot shake a hand with an FBI because I was on a tour to buy a chocolate business. And I was called overseas by an FBI agent after registering my name in the US Embassy. As a, for, as a citizen, when I travel overseas, I register my name. And the FBI agent called me overseas from Newark, New Jersey. What for? to investigate why I'm there. And when I showed her, and we wasted seven, eight hours later on, I'm involved with the humanitarian yeah. advocacy, bringing cultural activities between countries to promote civil liberties tomorrow, to exchange of information, cultures, all of that. My thought, we should abolish it. We should really fix the existing programs and sincerely stop really thinking of the nationals inside the country and abusing them. And instead of getting their loyalty enhanced to the country and <laughs> employing them for our services, I think it should be abolished. Thank you for Thank that. You. I will, uh, I'll tell you what I agree with and what I, uh, what I disagree with. Um, Please. The, it is incumbent upon every everybody, particularly those in law enforcement, particularly those that are working anything internationally, to learn and understand the cultures. If you're not doing it, you're not doing a very good job at what, what you're responsible for. So uh, people that were recruiting sources in, in different ethnic regions, even within the United States, I mean, that was part of uh, their responsibility. In fact, I can only speak for the FBI, part of our recruitment model was to recruit people that could spoke, speak the language, understand the culture, and would, would better be able to communicate with various different groups across the country. Um, to say we don't need a FISA, um, I think my personal view, it goes too far, because just like we have meetings in SCIFs, and there's certain conversations we can only have in the SCIF that we can't have on the floor of the house, there always needs to be a classified setting to hold uh, judicial hearings for national security matters. 
things that you can't discuss in a uh, Article Three court. So there's got to, there's always got to be that that you know just like in in the FBI. I mean, in in, in every agency, the court system, there's got to be two separate systems. But I agree with you. The, there's risks of lack of transparency and risks of abuse. That's exactly what this is all about. Do we do we abolish it? Well, then what replaces it? How, what, how do we have any judicial system involving the national security realm if we abolish it altogether? Uh, I can tell you that, um, and my colleagues can maybe share some examples, but there have been a lot of success stories that people in the public don't even know. Uh, terror, thwar- uh, terror attacks that were stopped, uh, large fentanyl drug rings that were stopped at the border that would have killed uh, 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 our children throughout the United States. Um, we hear the term, don't throw, throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that's appropriate here. I think we need to fix the system. Fix it, not abolish it. But that's just my opinion. I don't know if anyone else has to, what's the comment on that? No, you, well, I, yeah. you, I mean, I've, I think my opinion's pretty known. You could read anything that I've written. <clears throat> if you get rid of FISA, then you have Shamrock and Minaret, the executive branch authorizing warrantless, non-consensual yep. acquisition of U.S. personal communications. I mean, electronic surveillance isn't going to go away if you get rid of FISA. It's just going to be conducted the way it was before FISA, yeah. which is the president of the United States, the executive branch, on its own, decides who gets targeted and, and how it gets used and what happens to it. So uh, Congress, FISA was designed, as Congressman said, to get all three branches of the U.S. government involved in an activity that is going to take place in, in one form or another. And this is the compromise. It's not perfect. It's why every four, frankly, that's why traditional FISA has no expiration date, but 702 does. Congress recognized that the access to U.S. person communications was so delicate that this ought to be a program that comes up for reauthorization every so often so that Congress can do what it needs to do to make sure it's operating consistently with privacy and civil liberties. I, I disagree, obviously, for the reasons that I've said. If you don't have FISA, then you have the Nixon watch list program. It's been said already, codify compliance and codify adherence to the constitutional protections and increase transparency through reporting and and open reporting and you'll increase confidence. It's not gonna happen overnight, but it needs to happen. And I think that's the the solution at the end of the day. All right, well, I'm getting uh... Give me the flag here. Um, we're at our hour and a half uh, mark. Dr. Prisco, thank you for hosting us. Thank you to Holy Family. Thank you to our panelists. Um, please feel free if anybody has any comments, any feedbacks on this uh, or anything, really. But um, this is going to be consuming a lot of our attention over the next um, several weeks. Please reach out to our office. Um, like I said, I am uh, one of two members of the Intelligence Committee on this task force that's um, providing our input directly to the, the chair. Uh, both the chair of judiciary and intelligence um, in both chambers. Um, this is really important that we resolve this one way or another, but sunsetting it will be catastrophic because you lose the tool that you need and you're not making any of the fixes that you need to the, the area that does the fixes. And that doesn't make any sense at all. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. Thank you.